Well, Master Gardeners, I'm really privileged to introduce our next speaker today. Um, we have Tom Michaels from the University of Minnesota. He's a full professor there that specializes in breeding uh, dry beans and then also salad greens. He also happens to be one of my favorite individuals. I still remember the first time that I met Tom Michaels. So I happened to be uh, attending the University of Minnesota and he had just been hired. He came to my class to speak and he seemed like a mild-mannered individual until he got in front of the classroom and then you could see his passion for teaching. He really has that passion for teaching and we've all benefited from that. So today he's going to share his, his new passion which is hydroponic mm. salad tables. Uh, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy this as, as much as I have enjoyed um, learning from Tom. So Tom, take it away. Thanks, Esther. You're far too kind, but I hope some of that passion comes through today because the hydroponic salad table is a lot of fun. Well, thanks, folks, for coming to this presentation on the hydroponic salad table. As Esther said, I'm Tom Michaels, and I'm a professor here at the university. The cameraman is Mr. Colin Jones, who's a master's student here at the university in the Applied Plant Sciences program. And we even have three people in the live studio audience. Thanks, folks, for, for coming and giving me some moral support. So my goal today is to show you the hydroponic salad table, to show you the components that we put together and also how we manage the system in order to grow a nice crop of salad greens. My goal is that by the end of this session, you'll be so excited about it that you'll want to grow a crop of salad greens your own using this system to harvest a salad day right through September and October. So we only have 45 minutes today. I'm only going to be able to hit the highlights and show you some of the main parts of the table. But I understand that you have a copy of my manual at the conference. And so I recommend that if you're interested in this, that you take one of those manuals because it has all the detail you need to grow your own hydroponic salad tables. If you don't have a copy of it there, you can download a PDF of that manual at my website. And the best way to find that website is to do a Google search on hydroponic salad table and below the ads anyway, the first hit that you should get should be the link to that and you'll find the, um, the PDF of the manual there. So please get a hold of the manual so that we can get past just the highlights. Well, let me then introduce you to the hydroponic salad table. This is what it is. This is a salad table that is sized to provide one person a good sized salad a day over about six to eight weeks of harvest. Now, the main components that I want to show you real briefly here are this one has a, an enclosure that's just made out of lumber from the lumber store. It's actually optional. And inside then, we have a tote, which is really just a Rubbermaid, Rubbermaid style plastic storage tote. And I'll show you that in detail also. You'll see at the top, this white strip is a polystyrene lid. It's just a foam insulation lid in which I've placed net pots that each grow one plant. So I have 11 plants growing here. That's how we're getting our salad today. And you can see the roots are nice and white and very healthy and that there's no soil on them. This is a system where the roots are bathed in a nutrient solution and there's no soil. So those are just kind of how the parts go. Uh, what I'm going to do is show you each of those parts individually and talk a little bit more about them. But the idea behind the salad table and where this originally came from is that I wanted to develop a way that in uh, somebody in an urban situation who has no access to a garden, doesn't have soil available, can in their high rise apartment or condo uh, grow salad greens, a healthy uh, set of salad greens on an outdoor balcony that's facing, say, south or west. So it was originally planned as part of urban agriculture, but I'm finding it's equally well used in suburban decks or even in rural areas. So it's something that's found a home uh, all over, although it initially was uh, an exercise for urban agriculture. So let me show you again some of these parts in a little more detail. So this is our tote. 
It's a 10 gallon tote, and that's the size that I recommend for you. It's roughly two feet long and 14 and a half to 15 inches wide and nine inches deep. This is an ideal size. And so this is sized for one person. If you have two people you wanna grow for, then it's just a matter of growing two of these. A small family would be three. So that's how you multiply this to get the salad greens you need for the crowd that you're growing for. Uh, if you happen to use a different type of tote that has slightly different dimensions, you need to take that in count if you're building an enclosure. I have plans for different enclosures in the uh, website and in the manual. They all assume this size tote. So if you change your tote, and you want to use those enclosure dimensions, you need to make those adjustments. All right, so in this tote then goes a nutrient solution. So it's filled with water, and I'll talk more about the nutrient in a minute, but to that we add a hydroponic nutrient. And then I've also already mentioned the lid. This is a inch and a half thick expanded polystyrene foam lid. It's used for insulation in walls. For instance, if you were uh, renovating your basement or something like that. So it's easily found at home improvement uh, stores. And then there are holes that are cut into it. And into those holes, we place what's called, see if you can see it better that way, a net pot. So these net pots look like little yogurt containers with slits in the sides to let the um, roots come through as the plant grows. And they fit very nicely into the hole and you can see that underneath, it peaks out just a little bit to drop down into the nutrient solution. So we've got the bin, we've got the lid, and we've got the net pot. A fourth piece of uh, equipment that's important is perlite. And you're probably familiar with perlite as those white specks that you see in your potting medium. It's an expanded volcanic rock, so it's a natural product. And we're going to use this to grow our seedlings in the net pots. So that's pretty much it for what you need to really grow a hydroponic salad table, except for the seed. So let me talk about that uh, briefly. The basic salad green that I recommend for growing in the hydroponic salad table is lettuce. And the type of lettuce that you want to use is something that's loose leaf so that you can cut the leaves off easily. So a loose leaf lettuce or a romaine lettuce. The reason for that is we're going to use a harvesting strategy called cut and come again. That is, we're going to cut off some leaves uh, off the salad plant and then leave some, and in a week's time or so, we'll come back and harvest some more after they've grown. So we extend our harvest for several weeks that way rather than doing it all at once. Head lettuces are the other alternative, and they'll grow okay in this system. It's just that we don't want to harvest the whole head at once and then discard the plant. Let's extend our harvest over several weeks. So lettuce, I like to make maybe two thirds to three quarters of the plants that I grow in the table because there's such a great basis for a salad. But there are a lot of brassica greens that grow great in this system too. So just as an example, I have kale here. Collard greens grow really well. A lot of the Asian greens go well, grow well. Pak choy is really wonderful. So there are a lot of different brassicas you can grow. Oh, and you can grow nasturtiums in here too. So if you're a fan of nasturtium flowers having as a garnish on your salad or for their color that, that, and their spicy taste, you can grow nasturtiums as well. Uh, another brassica that grows well, especially if you like that spicy taste, is mustard or watercress grows well here. So if you like a little bit more spike to your salad, then these work well. And the last one I'm going to show you, although there are others you can grow, uh, is Swiss chard. Swiss chard I love in the table because of the petioles that have the various bright colors. It really brightens up the table, but also because I happen to like the fresh, the taste of the fresh leaves. It has kind of a dusty flavor that I think is really nice when blended with lettuce. And the other reason that I like, I like Swiss chard is it has a flavor, a flavor similar to spinach. And the problem is we can't grow spinach on this table. Spinach really doesn't like to have its roots down in the nutrient solution and it doesn't grow very well. So in a way, growing, growing Swiss chard is my substitute for being able to grow spinach. 
Now, one of the things that I want to mention, especially because you're master gardeners, is that this project lends itself to doing things cooperatively. That is getting three or four people among your master gardener friends who might want to try this project. The reason is that you can buy these articles in bulk and really save a lot of money. So for instance, this polystyrene foam, the cheapest way to purchase this is as a four foot by eight foot sheet. That will make 12 of these lids. You're not going to need 12. You might need three if you're say going to try to do salad greens for a small family. But if you can go together and, and uh, collectively spend $10 on a big sheet of this polystyrene, you can divide it up among you and save some money over trying to just buy a whole sheet by yourself and having it sit in your garage. Uh, also net pots. Net pots, you can buy them individually, but they're quite expensive that way. Instead, you can buy a pack of 100 for $18 or so, maybe, maybe a little less online, uh, and share them among your friends. And the other one that's easy to share is buying nutrient. This nutrient is uh, one kilo, 2.2 pounds, costs maybe 12 to $15, but it's enough to grow at least 15 tables. So again, you can divide it up among friends. So I want to just point out, this is a project that we can do uh, where we share the costs and, and share the materials and make it cheaper that way. All right, so Colin, I'm going to move around here. We're going to talk a little bit about planting. All right. So you want to start plants about four weeks before you expect to do your first harvest. So if I can get you to try this this year, you might want to have your first harvest around Labor Day. So that means come back four weeks, so right around the beginning of August, end of July, you'll want to start your seedlings. Now I grow, I'm going to recommend that you grow about 10 plants if you grow one of these uh, modules, one of these salad tables. So that means you'll need at least 10 nut, net pots for every one of these uh, modules you're going to grow. So here's what we do with them. So here's our net pot, our perlite. Moisten the perlite before you work with it because as you probably know, it's very dusty and it'll make you choke. You simply fill the net pot and tap it a little bit, but you don't need to really scrunch it in. And so there's our net pot full of perlite. I'm going to grab some seeds. What have I got here? Mustard green seeds. Now, when I normally, when I normally uh, do planting out in the garden, I'm going to take a pinch of lettuce or whatever it is and run it along the furrow. And we don't want to do that in this system. We want to only plant three seeds per pot. So let's take a look down here. The reason we want to do three seeds per pot is we're going to thin the plants to just one. If we plant a whole bunch of seeds in here, we're going to, when we thin out the ones we don't want, we're going to disturb the plant we want to keep. So instead, let's just grow three. I'm going to make three little holes. They're somewhere between three eighths and a half inch deep. Not very deep at all. I'm planting three seeds, covering it up. I'm going to put a stake in there that has the name on it, because I don't know about you, but about two seconds after I planted, I forget whether it was lettuce or whether it was mustard, and now I'm ready to go. Now, I mentioned that I'm going to recommend you grow 10 plants per one of these uh, storage totes. Uh, but one of the things you can do is plant 12, because if you have some older seed that's maybe turns out to be a dud and doesn't germinate, if you grow 12 pots, you'll probably have 10 that are okay. You can also do some transplanting, and I'll show that later. But you might, for 10, plant 12. Now, also, if you have seed that you find uh, might be a couple of years old and you're not quite sure of the germination, just up the number that you grow. Instead of three, you can put two more holes on the front and back and plant five. And then when it comes time to thin, you'll be able to choose your best plant and keep that. All right, so that's planting. The next, keep it there Colin, because I'm gonna come up with the capillary bed. So the next thing I want to show you is what we're going to, what I recommend you put the 
net pots in in order to germinate the seeds. And what we use is just a flat. Uh, this is a half greenhouse flat. It's got no perforations in it. So it's going to hold water. Into it, I add perlite. So this is just a perlite bed. And then I add water to it to create what I call a bog, but not a swamp. So a swamp has water sitting on top. A bog has water just below the surface. So if you can see, I don't know if you can see that, that's pretty hard, but as I just go down a half an inch, that's water there. So I've got a bog, not a swamp. I'm gonna go down just that quarter to half an inch and place my net pot in it. So what's happening now? We've got water down in the, in the perlite. It's going to be wicked up. Perlite's great at wicking water. It's going to be wicked up into the net pot it's going to provide just the right amount of moisture for those seedlings to germinate. And it's not going to be too much moisture, which you know is one of the big problems with trying to germinate seed, drowning the seed. So here we go, we've got a, a capillary bed, we've got our net pots, we've got it planted. And at this point, I'm just going to cover it. I'll have my 10 or 12 net pots in there, cover it with some sort of a clear plastic dome or a piece of plastic just until the seeds germinate to keep the moisture high. I'm going to place this in, a, in diffuse light, not in direct sunlight. I normally do it inside near a window. You don't want to do it in the dark because some lettuce actually needs light to germinate. So with the dome, put it in subdued light, off we go. A week later, now you call and you're going to be looking to your right side here. A week later, on the right side, you'll see seedlings that I have germinated, uh, that I planted a week ago. I'm looking for my tweezer, there it is. I, I planted a week ago, and so you can see the stage they'll be in about a week. They've germinated, I've taken the domes off, and you can see, if you look carefully, one, two, three, one, two, three, I've got three seedlings coming up. Now, I have to tell you, I cheated a bit before the webinar. I went through and picked out one or two extras that spilled because I'm not perfect in just planting three seeds. Uh, but nevertheless, you get the idea. They're nicely spaced. So what's a good one for me to take? Can you see that one there, Colin? So I've got three plants here. At this stage, they're very easy to just pull up by the roots. So I'm pulling out a plant pulling out another plant. I might dig around the base a little bit to get them to come out a little easier. There we go. So I've now thinned after one week, I've thinned it to one plant per. There's one, two exceptions really. If you're growing Swiss chard, leave two plants because uh, they don't quite grow as well in this system as they do in a garden. They don't get as big. So if you grow two plants in this net pot, it works out perfectly. So I'll just show you again an example. Now, of, of taking two out. What I want to do is take out uh, a lettuce plant. Well, let me take this mustard plant, for instance, just as an example. Now, with this mustard plant, when I brought it out, I still have a nice root system attached to it. I haven't damaged it too much. If you, for instance, have some pots that are uh, that were blanks, that were duds, nothing came up, at this stage, you can transplant these seedlings into those dud pots and they'll grow great without any damage. So you can either grow 12 pots in order to get 10 or grow 10 and be ready to do some transplanting into the pots where you didn't get good germination. All right, so now we have, we have our seedlings grown. We've gotten, gotten them thinned to uh, one plant. We just let them grow now uh, for another week and I'll come back and look at these in a moment. So we're going to spend two weeks then uh, letting the plants grow. And so we have a little bit of time uh, while we're letting the seedlings grow. So what do you do during that time? I recommend that you use that to, for instance, build an enclosure like I showed you uh, earlier, uh, or to find a table or bench on which you're going to put this uh, salad table system. Now I have two criteria that I want you to try to match when you're either making a, uh, an enclosure or finding a table or bench to put it on. And that is, it needs to be strong enough to hold 80 pounds. Because you're putting 10 gallons of water into this tote, and that's going to be 80 pounds, so it has to be sturdy. The other thing that you're going to need to do is to be able to have a, um, a table 
or a place on your tote where you can make it absolutely dead level. So let me show you an example. And by the way, I should say about enclosures, I think I said this earlier, I have plans for enclosures that hold one or two or three totes in the manual. So uh, if you'd like to build some, uh, you can take a look at those designs or it's easy enough to design your own. Now, sometimes you don't care about having a, uh, an enclosure. You just want to grow the tote naked, uh, the, the, leave the tote naked like this, uh, especially if you have a number of totes, building enclosures becomes time, uh, time consuming. Uh, so you can just put it on a table, but you need to get it level. So I just pull out my trusty level, and this is telling me that I've got a high side over here and a low side over here. So I take some wooden shims and just shim it underneath until I get that bubble level. It's not quite level yet, so I'll put another shim underneath. And there we go, it's nice and level this way. And I know from having done this before we started that it's going to be level this way. So get out your level and, and use it on your totes. The reason you need to do that is because we're going to end up filling this tote all the way up to the rim with nutrient solution. And remember how the net pod peaked out the bottom of that expanded polystyrene lid? We want the bottom of the net pot to be down into that nutrient solution ever so little bit, but it needs to touch. And if we have our, our bin kind of a kilter and we have uh, up to the rim on this side, it's going to be below the rim, maybe a quarter inch, a half inch on the other side, and that's going to leave your net pot high and dry the roots will be out of the water, it's going to dry up and die. So we absolutely need to have to start, we need to have this bin dead level. It's not quite as important later, but that's fine. Uh, it needs to be level when you start. Another tip, if you don't have a bar level like this, but you have a smartphone, you can get some really trick and free uh, apps for your smartphone that allow you to determine level. So all you need is a straight board, put your smartphone on and it'll tell you how to get it level. Okay, so uh, I might as well tell you this at this stage, if you're going to use the tote with an enclosure, that holds the sides in just fine. But if you use the tote naked and fill it with this nutrient solution, it's going to bulge out until it can actually get beyond the edges of the lid, which is more unsightly than really a problem. But nevertheless, the thing that I do when I'm growing a tote naked like this is I get a, a wire that's about the diameter of a clothes hanger wire, and I measure it to be the width of the tote plus two inches. And then I will, on one end, take one inch and bend it down at a right angle. On the other end, bend it down at a right angle. So now I've got hooks at both ends, and this bale then goes over the tote and holds it against those forces of the nutrient solution that are pushing it out. So it's just a little tip in order to uh, be able to use this uh, naked like, like that. So let's talk about the nutrient solution because that's what ne what's next. Once we get this uh, in place and we know it's level, and it's been two weeks and we're ready to transplant our seedlings, which I'll show you in a moment, then it's time to start adding the nutrient solution. The first thing I'll do is just fill this up halfway with water, get some weight in it. I'll check the level again, make sure it's level. When it's only half full, it's only 40 pounds, it's easier to put the shims in. If you wait to get it level when it's 80 pounds, it's really hard to move. So but do your leveling first. So now we've got this half full of water. It's time for me to add my nutrient solution. So I got a couple things to say about nutrient solution. The first is you really need to use a nutrient solution that's specifically for hydroponics. And that's because of the form of nitrogen that's in the nutrient solution. Hydroponic nutrient solutions have their nitrogen in the form of nitrate. Uh, the types of, there are other types of fertilizers, such as the soluble fertilizers that you might put into your watering can to water pots or even put on your garden, miracle Grow type of products. Those, if you take a look at them, have their nitrogen from urea, and it's in the form of ammonium. And that really can't be used in hydroponics. It can even kill the plants 
uh, if you use a strictly ammonium type of nutrient solution. So don't use miracle Grow type products. You need to purchase something with high amounts of nitrate. And it'll say right on the back, if you look at the nutrient and look at the analysis, this one for, for instance says 85% nitrate, 15% ammonium, that's great. That's, that's a really nice ratio. Now, you can't find this everywhere. If you go to one of your home improvement centers or something like that and look for soluble fertilizers, uh, I've tried this and I've never found any uh, where I am. So you either have to find it at a hydroponic shop or if you don't have one near you, look online. This one is made by General Hydroponics. It's called MaxiGrow. You can purchase this at uh, Amazon for somewhere between $12 and $14 plus shipping. So it's a reasonable price. As I mentioned before, you can split it several ways among friends and uh, grow up to 15 different salad tables. So in any case, I've made my pitch about use hydroponic nutrient, okay? Now, uh, we've got this half full of water. Because it's a 10% nitrogen solution, I know that I need to add 45 grams of that nutrient to this uh, water in order to get it to the point of 120 parts per million nitrogen. Now, if you're interested in the rate of nitrogen, uh, you can go up to 150 parts per nitrogen, maybe down to 100, but I like to go 120. I've got a lot more about that and different measurements in the uh, hydroponic salad table manual. So I won't go into that much more deeply here, but suffice it to say, I'll end up taking 45 grams, which is equal to two and a half tablespoons of this nutrient, put it into uh, the bin, stir it around, usually keep a paint stir stick around to get it dissolved, it dissolves rather quickly. And then I'm going to add water up to within about an inch of the rim. At this point, not all the way up, because when you first start out doing this, it's a really good idea to check the pH. pH, as you know, is going to be the acidity or alkalinity. You're used to doing that with soil, but it becomes really important with hydroponics because it, it can determine whether or not the nutrients can be taken up by the plant roots. So we want to have a, a, a pH of between 5.5 and 6.5. Now, the water in St. Paul anyway is up around pH 8. And this, this type of a nutrient is going to be buffered, and it's going to, when I add it, it's going to drop the pH down probably in the neighborhood of six and a half, something like that. But it's still worth checking to make sure you're in the 5.5 five to 6.5 range. So the way you do that is through a pH uh, uh, control kit, and this also is made by General Hydroponics, also available online, also something you can share with friends. It happens to be cost roughly in the neighborhood of 15 to 18 dollars this alone is probably seven or eight dollars but it's a great idea to be able to do some testing so the way it works is you dip out some of your nutrient solution uh, that you have uh, added up to within about an inch of the rim this is just a tap water uh, and that i grabbed and to it i'm going to add three drops you don't have to be exact it could be less or more give it a shake and you can see that it's turned color, and I match that color to colors uh, on here, and you can see that my, what do you say that is, Colin? That's somewhere between eight and eight and a half, don't you think? Somewhere between green and blue. So this is tap water, and as I'm mentioning, the tap water in St. Paul comes out a little bit alkaline. So if, I, if that were my nutrient solution, I'd know I need to add some acid. So this kit comes with pH up, with it, which is a base, and this one, which you'll use more, is pH down, which is your acid. You can add some acid to this, and I'd do it slow. Just start with maybe a tablespoon at first, see how much it changes. You want to sneak down on getting your nutrient solution down into that five and a half to six and a half range. Once you get in that range, don't try to be exact. Just get it there, and then you're fine. It'll be relatively stable. All right, so that's pH. Actually, what you'll find is you won't need to worry about pH once you get a feel for it and have done this several times because you know your tap water and you know your nutrient and it all works out fine. Okay then, so we've got our nutrient ready to go. We need to talk about our uh, styrofoam. So here's our rigid styrofoam. It's cut, this one's cut two feet. 
by 16 inches. And I've got on it, I don't know if you can see that. You see my 11 dots? I've got eight on each side and three in the middle. That's where I'm going to put my holes. Now I mentioned I want you to grow 10. So why do I have 11? It's because I have one of these dots in the middle that I'm going to cut out, but I'm going to keep the core of it and use it as a stopper. And that's how I'm going to be able to check my nutrient solution with a dipstick. I'll show you what I mean. Now, you can cut out the holes for the net pots with a knife, or if you have a two inch hole saw that you want to attach to your drill, that works great too, but it's kind of messy. It makes a lot of little balls of styrofoam. My favorite way of doing it, believe it or not, is this six ounce tomato paste can, which is a small can. And you can see I've cut out the bottom and the top, and I've sharpened one edge. And believe it or not, this cuts perfectly. You can see the net pot fits in it just great. So when I cut the hole, I know the net pot's going to sit in there perfectly. So I'm going to center this over the hole, give a few twists, and as easy as that, I've got, I feel like I'm doing a ShamWow commercial, right? Uh, so as easy as that, I've got my nice hole. I pop out the core, and now I've got my little porthole through which I can check the nutrient solution. All the other holes are going to have plants in it. If you want to stack this completely full of plants, sure, you can use that for, uh, for another plant and just lift the lid when you want to check the nutrient. That's fine too. Or you can put in a complete row of four in here and grow 12 plants. But I like the idea of growing 10. I think it uses the nutrient solution well. Okay, so now we've got you can imagine we've got our bin with our holes in it. It's time to transplant seedlings. So you'll remember the other half of this capillary bed has seedlings that have grown for roughly now two weeks. And this happens to be a Swiss chard. The roots probably will have grown down into the nutrient solution, into the perlite slightly. So I dig them out. Well, you can see there's a little bit of root there. I love chard because if it has red petioles, it often has red stems. And so knock off just a little bit of this, the um, perlite without damaging the roots. And down it goes into the lid. And I should have mentioned after we do the pH adjustment, you want to bring the nutrient solution right up to the rim. That'll tell you whether you've got it level or not. Right up to the rim, we've got our nutrient solution. So when we put our transplants in there, you can see that the net pot peeks out a little bit. We've got our roots there and down it goes. It's touching the nutrient solution. So this seedling now has access to water and nutrients just fine. So again, use a, use a, a spoon to pull these out because that way you're not going to be damaging any roots. Normally, I like these to have a little bit more root. Hopefully, when you grow them for two weeks, especially if you get them outside a bit, the last two, three days, harden them off before your two-week period, you'll have a little bit more fluffy root coming out when you do your transplanting. All right, so I've got a couple more minutes. Let me show you how to manage this system. This is a table that's been growing Is that an okay spot, Colin, or should I get a closer? This has been growing for about, excuse me, for about um, six weeks now, maybe five weeks. Uh, it's overgrown a little bit. I was holding it so I could use it for, for uh, this particular harvest. You'll see it's got a nice mix of plants. We've got different colors of lettuces. We've got some kale. Uh, we've, we've got somewhere in here, oh, here's our mustard. Uh, they're starting to look like they're wilting a bit because I don't have them in the nutrient solution. That's what, what it's looking like underneath, looking real nice roots. But what I want to show you is harvest. So we're going to do a cut and come again harvest. Here's the important thing. I want you to leave when you harvest three or four leaves so that they can grow and you can harvest them next time. So with this particular plant, I'm going to take the oldest leaves first. And all I'm doing is cutting them with a scissor or with a knife. I'm cutting the oldest ones, just following them up. 
and I'm leaving now. So these are for eating, and I'm leaving here. In this case, four. I've got this thumb-sized one. I've got a slightly larger leaf. Here's my third leaf. I could possibly take this one off, but I'm going to leave it because I have some other things I want to harvest, and that's what my harvest is. Now I can come back in a week's time or maybe even sooner uh, and start, and these will all have grown to be as big as these guys are, and I can take another four or five leaf harvest off it. So that's what I mean by cut and come again. Same sort of thing with the, uh, with the kale. I'm going to cut it down in this case, take three nice leaves for, for my salad. Oh, it's starting to wilt a bit. Uh, and I'm leaving four leaves. Here's my little thumb-sized one, an emerging leaf, nearly full size and a full size leaf. I can come back in half a week or a week and be able to get more salad greens from it. So that's how you do harvest, little at a time. Take the, the harvest that you need. You can take about a, once this thing gets rolling, about an ounce at a time. You can start harvesting four weeks after you plant your seed, two weeks after you transplant. Uh, and you won't take this big a harvest. It'll be smaller. Once you get to the fifth week after planting, your plants will be this big and you'll be off and running. I want to leave you with one, one last idea, and that is how to manage this besides the harvest. And I'm going to have to draw. So Colin, if I can get over to the board here, I'm going to have to reach because of my cable. Imagine that this is our tote. This is our 10 gallon tote. And on top of that tote, we have our polystyrene lid. And in that lid, we have our net pots and we have some salad greens plants growing off them. Okay, now we start out with the nutrient solution when they're first seedlings, we start out with the nutrient solution right up to the rim, right? So that the net pots that are extended down a little bit into the nutrient solution can wick up that moisture for those emerging roots. Now the roots are gonna grow like crazy. You think the top grows fast, the roots are gonna grow fast too. And they're going to grow down into this nutrient solution just fine and over time, because those plants are transpiring, the nutrient solution is going to start being used up. So let's imagine that these plants that I just showed you uh, would have used up nutrients so that it's down maybe two, two and a half inches. And that is forming what I call an air gap. This air gap is really important to maintain. This space between the bottom of the lid and the top of the nutrient solution should continue to be there because that's how the plant roots uh, take in oxygen for respiration to produce energy for growth and how they exhaust carbon dioxide. They can't do it through their roots into the nutrient solution uh, because the, new, the water can't hold that much CO2 and oxygen. But instead, these roots that are dangling in the air gap differentiate to take in uh, air and also to exhaust CO2. So we've got to maintain this. Eventually what will happen is that this nutrient solution drops down about halfway. It can even go down further. It can go down uh, maybe three quarters and you're still okay. The roots will be down in it. It'll be exchanging gases in the air gap. Once it gets down around halfway or three quarters down, now's when you want to add nutrient solution and make sure that the solution stays somewhere between one half and one quarter full. So the air gap is always half of the bin to three quarters of the bin. You need the air gap. So don't ever, when you fill up with nutrient solution, try to take it up to the rim again. What you'll see is your plants will actually wilt. And if you leave it long enough, they'll die. Uh, so you want to maintain the air gap. Just as a parting thought, we had a big rain here last night. And my my uh, salad tables that I have in home filled up with water. So they had a nice air gap like this, but it got filled up by rain just by dribbling through where the, those holes. And so I'm going to go home tonight and I'm going to bail out that water to reestablish the air gap. Because again, if that air gap gets filled up, the plants can't respire and the roots will die. So that's just something to watch for when you grow this. Mind your air gap, make sure you have one. 
uh, don't ever fill it up back all the way. And if it rains, check and reestablish the air gap so the plants continue to grow. Okay, so that's my presentation so far. I hope you have some questions. And I also hope that you're interested in getting some seedlings started beginning of August so you can start a salad table around the first uh, around Labor Day. So thanks so much. Okay, Tom, we do have some questions here in Fargo. Good. Uh, yes, I'm Rhonda Miller, and I'm really interested in, in doing your salad table. At the oh, beginning, great, you said that the solution would be all the way to the top yes. of the container. But then later on, you told us about the importance of air to right. get oxygen for the roots. So when you originally put the styrofoam with the containers and the, the seed containers on the tub, what level was the water at? So this is on initially. It is completely full when you first put the uh, transplanted seedlings. So this will be roughly two weeks after you planted seed. We've got our seedlings with just a few rudimentary roots. So they don't have strong roots coming out yet. Poking out the bottom, this gets filled all the way to the top. And I, I, I neglected to tell you that stop step after I got so excited about pH and all that. So you fill it all the way up to the rim. So now when you do the transplanting, put a, initially put all your plants in there, it's full to the rim. That way the bottom of the net pot touches the nutrient solution and the perlite will wick up the nutrients to the roots. Okay? Okay, thank you. you bet. I guess we have another question. Does arugula work in there? It does, yes it does. Uh, arugula is, am I right, that's another uh, brassica type plant and so it, uh, it forms a nice rosette. It's not tall. Uh, when I've grown it, it's been a nice rosette and the only, uh, uh, it's not even a problem. You will see that the leaves are closer together. The inner nodes are so short on arugula that you have to get in there carefully with your knife or your scissor to cut it. it grows great. So does endive. Frisee, uh, that's a great, that's a, in the lettuce family and that grows really well too. Have you tried growing it indoors under lights? Yes, I have. And uh, I always do every winter uh, grow indoors. Even in this classroom, I have uh, uh, have it. Now, the trick is light. Uh, you need to have a, a good amount of light. A window's not enough. Uh, a, a regular workshop, a shop light isn't enough. What I recommend people do is get three LED shop lights. And so there, I, I'm a member at Costco, so I've seen them there, but you can also pick them up at Home Depot or other um, home improvement areas. But LED shop lights that have two strips of LEDs in them. They normally look just like little tubes, but inside them are strips of LEDs and they're kind of narrow. And if I put three side by side, I can grow two of these uh, bins end to end. It'll be four foot. So you'll have three of these four foot uh, uh, shop lights and that'll be enough light to be able to grow the salad greens. You need to get them low, but that'll work great. So uh, those shop lights run somewhere in the neighborhood of $20 each. Uh, and so uh, for $60, sounds like a lot, but for $60, uh, you're set to go for growing inside for, for quite a while. I have one more question. Is it possible to get scum on top of the solution or is that not a problem like it is with rain barrels? Right. I haven't had that problem and the same concern I've had with uh, mosquitoes, for instance. Do I need to use BT or something like that to keep mosquitoes down? I'm happy to say that uh, be this, this lid keeps it very dark uh, in the solution, so I don't get buildup of any scum or algae. The, the nutrient solution stays really clear, doesn't smell or anything like that, and I've never seen uh, any mosquitoes in it. However, I do watch for that just uh, just in case. If you use a different type of bin that's, for instance, uh, translucent or clear, and I've seen people do that, it will scum up with algae pretty quickly. But if you use an opaque bin, either these blue ones or gray ones or something like that, then it works quite well. And then we have one final question. You had mentioned that rain had filtered into your system. Yes. Did you have to adjust the concentration of your nutrients? Good question. Uh, if I've just noticed that it added a little bit, I don't worry about it anymore. I just 
bail it out so I have the air gap that I'd like and, and I call it a day. I don't worry that I've dropped my concentration. However, if you have a big rain, say you have a three inch downpour or something like that, and it goes from having half a, half a toad, a nice big air gap, to suddenly having none and it's completely full, then I'd worry that, you know, I've probably diluted that a lot. And what I might do at that stage is completely empty it out and start over. Uh, and what I mean by starting over is if I know I had a, a, a three inch air gap before that rain, I would dump this out on some of my other plants. I wouldn't waste it because it's good nutrient. But then I'd, I'd make about five gallons of nutrient, maybe seven gallons of nutrient, add the correct amount of nutrient to it, fill it up, and then I know it's perfect again. So it depends on how much dilution. My first answer then is I wouldn't be too concerned about it if it's just a little bit, but if it's a lot, probably the easiest thing is to start over. The tendency is to want to just, let's just add a little nutrient, and that's going to be okay too, but but you, you might consider starting from scratch and just making new nutrient because the nutrient's not that terribly expensive. Well, Tom, we have run out of time, but my master gardeners have thoroughly enjoyed this presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks, um, sister. And thank you, and have a great weekend, Tom. Very good. Thank you all. Thanks for attending. Thank you. Thank you.